being the 30th installment of this series of lessons in Ephesians. It may appear in a sense like we're plodding, plodding along here, but uh, it really isn't what we're doing. These are exceeding... Well, they're foundational things. And because in our day there's not been a lot of talk about the foundations, there's a sound of strangeness about them. At the same time, there's a sense of familiarity. When you hear them, they kind of resonate with your spirit. You feel like you're in the home waters, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, we're seeing here that part of salvation involves your one's understanding of what's going on in salvation and what God's doing in salvation and what the purpose of it is. That's, that's part of the salvation. And that's what Paul is doing. He's opening, it, opening this up to us because this is what he's been given to do for the Gentile believers. Now, throughout apostolic doctrine, and most of the apostolic doctrine is Paul's. I mean, it's, you know, I have to pause and say this every once in a while that most of the apostles' doctrine that we know about is belongs to Paul. Uh -huh. The reason is because of the dominance of the Gentile church. Uh -huh. So Paul was raised up to minister to the Gentile church. It's just that the Gentile church apparently doesn't know this. So of all the people that are neglected in the Bible, yeah. Paul is the most. Yeah. Yeah. His teachings are the least known, least understood, least declared. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal when I think about it. Now there are key words he's introduced us to that give us some idea of the message of the gospel because the salvation and the whole work of God hinges around a message. Yeah. <laughs> Now, with Israel, it, hin it hinged around a memory. If they would back to remind them they came out of Egypt, you came out of Egypt, you came out of Egypt, you remind them to the prophets, you came out of Egypt, you remind them of that. It's a bit different in Christ Jesus. Everything hinges on a message and announcement. Mm -hmm. Message is an announcement. Mm -hmm. It's a report. It's like headlines. Yeah. And everything in the kingdom's a headline. <laughs> And Paul has introduced us to some of these key words, particularly in this third chapter. Let me give you a few of them. Dispensation. Which you should have said it has to do with dispensing something. The dispensation of the grace of God. So God dispenses Grace, and he dispensed a lot of it to Paul. Grace to say something. So this now is associated with the salvation of God, dispensation. Not doing, dispensation. They start with the same letter, but they aren't the same. Right. Dispensation. Another is revelation. That's in our text. Revelation. That's a key word now in uh, the matter of the gospel of Christ. Another is, the th third verse is called mystery. <laughs> Sound like they don't go together, but uh, you'll see they do. Yeah. Another one, verse four, is understand. Mm -hmm. Do you realize how few people really understand mm -hmm. God and Christ and the salvation and the gospel? Just talk with some people. Just talk with some people, professing Christians, any of them. Just talk with them. You'll pick up on this, that this understanding is at kind of a low level. Not many people have an impressive understanding of the gospel and of Christ and of salvation. But they should. This is an inexcusable situation. Understand. Here's another one. 
fourth verse. A key, these are key words. Knowledge. See, salvation is an economy of knowledge. There's a whole body of things that you know. By a body of things, I say like science has a body of things it deals with. It's a whole body of thinking, a whole kind of thinking, a whole array of eternal verities salvation has to do with. And you're no more saved than you know. You say, well, you're either all saved or, well, that's not too simplistic. <clears throat> salvation is a big word, and one of the key things in salvation is knowledge. It's spiritual knowledge. This isn't ABC knowledge. It's not the rudiments of the world knowledge. It's a different kind of knowledge. Here's another one, mystery of Christ. We're going to be introduced to that. Mystery of Christ. We're talking to the church now. We're not talking to the heathen people. Mm -hmm. The mystery of Christ. Mm -hmm. There's more to Jesus than you've seen. Mm -hmm. yes. There are hidden things about Christ that are being opened up on a regular basis. You've already experienced it. You already know if you were to tally up sometime how much more you know about Christ than you did before, sometime back, it would astound you. Yes. The mystery of Christ. In other words, this is something God opens up. He wants you to understand Jesus more than yourself. The philosopher says, know thyself. And it sounds so smart. So the people of the world, particularly young college students, they say, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And they should say, who is Jesus? Where did he come from? Yeah. What is he doing? Yes, amen. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Amen. And what you know about yourself, you want it to filter through Christ. You want Christ to expose you to, to you. You want Jesus himself to show you yourself. And he's able to do this. Here's another word, another message. He focuses on he's blessed us. This is chapter 1, verse 3. And notice these, these verbs. They're all things God did. Blessed us. <coughs> verse 4 says he has chosen us. Verse 5 says he's predestinated us. Verse 6 says he made us accepted Verse 8 of verse chapter 1, he abounded toward us. Verse 9 says, he made known unto us. Verse 19, the exceeding greatness of his powers toward us. He loved us. Chapter 2, verse 4, he quickened us. Chapter 2, verse 5, he raised us. Chapter 2, verse 6, he made us sit together in heavenly places. Chapter 2, verse 6. In the ages to come, he'll show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Chapter 2, verse 7. We are indeed his workmanship. Chapter 2, verse 10. Now, if you read about these things, he's opening up salvation. He's opening up salvation. What is salvation really about? Is it about you? No, it's not about you. It's about what God's done Amen. to you Amen. and for you and in you. This accents the fact that the condition into which men were cast by sin cannot be resolved by them doing something. Not of works. That's how Paul put it. Not of works. See, because he's outlined to you your salvation. It all consists in what God's done. From the beginning, chose you, predestinated you, loved you, accepted you. It's all what he did, not what you did. Now, some of you are glad when they're finally able to do something. They say, well, thank God I was able to do that. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that, but you want to really thank God for what he's done. We are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus. So that's the first and foremost thing a person has to understand about salvation. It's not at last I got the load taken off. That, you did. I mean, this is something that did happen. But it, you've got to see more than that to maintain your grace. Our state or condition was changed by God. That's what he's establishing. And the message is the announcement of that over and over. The gospel of Christ, that's the preaching of Christ. Well, the preaching of Christ and him crucified. This is the message that all this that he's announced is attached to that message. The gospel announces all of this that we just read about that the majority of Christians don't know about. Mm -hmm. But the gospel announces it. Yeah. Which means either they have not heard the gospel or they heard it and forgot it. Yeah. Preaching the gospel is not just to get people in. Yeah. It's to yeah. keep people in. Yeah. And to keep people in, you've got to remind them that salvation is of the Lord. And Paul has given insights into this that the other people didn't talk about. I don't know that it, you could say they didn't know about it, but the, Paul talked about it and ministered to, it, to us. He so arranged things that the only way men can be effectively changed into his likeness is through a message. You shelve that message, you shut down the change. I'm not telling, I'm not, this is no lie. If the gospel, the gospel like Paul preaches it, if that isn't preached, you're going to have to resort to some man-made plan to change people or you think you're going to change people, which is precisely what has happened. The gospel's not being preached, yet that people need to be changed, so they come up with their own ways to change people. And they tell you, this will change you. This will strengthen you. This will bring you closer to God. You just, if you just follow this routine closely, you'll get more grace, and so forth and so forth. But Paul takes you back. He tells you this whole thing is of God. From before you got involved, to when you got involved, to after you got involved, it's all of God. Amen. And you can't trust God if you don't know this. Yeah. Amen. If you don't know what God's done, you can't trust in God. You're fooling yourself. Mm -hmm. It's more like a wish. What people call faith today is really kind of like a wish. Uh -huh. I hope the thing all turns out. Mm -hmm. Knowing God, which is through the gospel... Remember, it's through a message that all this happens. Amen. Not through feelings, through a message. Yes. God has ordained a message to save them that believe. Amen. Now our text is verses 3 and 4 of chapter 3. He's talking about now how... The, He's showing that the message I'm preaching is the message God uses to do all this that I've been talking about. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand. I say, when ye read, I say, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul knew after he told you, you had to understand it to get the benefit of it. All right, now how will Paul elaborate on this dispensation of the grace of God that was given to him? How will, how will he develop that dispensation of the grace of God? <clears throat> it came to him also by means of a message. And this message is by, is by grace... Salvation is by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. 
which is what he stated in verse 7. It's by grace through faith. By grace, God saves you because he wants to save you. God saves you because he finds delight in saving you. See? God saves you because in Christ you're favored. His mind's towards you. Today, there's too much nebulous talk about the grace of God. It's like, it's like foggy. It's like waters you can't see very deep. A lot of talk about grace, people have no idea what they're talking about. They say it's unmerited favor. Who said it's unmerited favor? Who said that? That's not even what the word means. Mercy is unmerited favor. Mm -hmm. Yet Paul, you pick up Paul's senses that grace is something you have to understand. If you're going to make any progress in the faith, you've got to understand something about grace. Because yeah. the whole thing, salvation, is all by grace. Mm -hmm. God's moved by what he desires, not what you desire. Amen. You may desire and desire and desire to grow and desire to have strong faith and desire to be pleasing to God. It may be a legitimate desire, but if you stop your ears and you're not hearing the gospel, that's all it is is a desire. Yeah, that's right. Nothing's going to come from it. I say nothing's going to come from it until a person starts thinking about and around the gospel He'll be, he won't know anything about grace. It'll just be a word. That's all. At its core, salvation is not the absence of damnation. Salvation is what you are and what you do in Christ. Salvation is what you are, not what you aren't. Now, the point it means to come to an understanding of this Marvelous change that takes place in man, we call it born again, workmanship of God, created in Christ Jesus, new creation. See, those are terms about the change. We're changed from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. Even as by his spirit, we're delivered from the power of darkness and translated to the kingdom of God's son. We were not a people, now we are the people. We have not obtained mercy, now we have obtained mercy. This change is traced back to grace, which is traced back to God and revealed in Christ through the message of the gospel. The gospel, it contains all the ingredients, if I may use that word, that are necessary to construct a life that pleases God. Amen. The gospel contains all the yeah. ingredients. It's like the kitchen cupboard. If you want to make a good work, so to speak, you have to draw from the cupboard of salvation and the gospel. You've got to draw from, right. you've got to draw from that to do it. Now, now the question arises, but which gospel are we Gentiles going to believe? Because there were some other gospels being preached even back in the first century. There was another gospel, Paul said, which is not another. And the Galatians and the Corinthians had the same. They heard another gospel. It wasn't the gospel of Christ. It wasn't the real gospel. It was a different gospel. Which means it didn't, that gospel didn't contain what is needed to maintain your state in Christ. So you get a gospel that's not bona fide, it's like a thief and a robber. You can't, you can't shape your life to please God with an erroneous gospel. It, God won't let it happen. God will not allow you to end up like he wants you if you use another gospel. So what does Satan do? He's vigorous. Relentless, as Brother Tony would say. He is relentless to fabricate other gospels. Some people come to Christ to straighten their marriage out. Wrong reason. 
I say it's the wrong reason. Some people come to Christ to straighten their family out. Yep. Straighten their finances out. Yep. Some people come to Christ to straighten out their health. Mm -hmm. So there's gospels that teach people this is what it's all about. This is the gospel. <laughs> Gospel of health and wealth. That's what God wants. God wants you to be rich so you can lose more when you die. Yeah. Oh, that part they don't. <laughs> they don't tell you that part. But yes, man out the desert, you know, and the only way to live is to draw water from the wells of salvation. Right. And yet the devil's deceiving them to think this sand here—that's water. It's good that's for right. you. It'll kill you. That's right. Amen. Poison water, even. They used to tell us in the old Wild West days that a lot of water was poisoned, so whoever found out, it's, they put a sign up there, yeah. you know, <laughs> don't drink. <laughs> if you had little stickers, this would be good. There's a lot of tracks and books and stuff you could put like, don't read. Important distinction to make that these other Gospels, not only do they just not profit the people, they do take from them. Mm -hmm. They Amen. made that That's point, right. but it's That's very right. important to see. Yes, it is. It's not just a static uh, condition. It's actually thievery. It's taking from the people. Oh, but amen. just as true as that is, the true gospel in Christ Jesus continues to add more and more. Amen. To amen. To people who believe. Mm -hmm. See, would you go ahead, Sister Tasha? Yeah, to add to that, too, the, that those other gospels actually pin their, their thinking to the earth, which is passing right. away. Yeah. Right. Amen. Now, once a person understands that the only man that God honors without qualification is Christ. And the gospel is the message. So this all makes perfect sense once you see it. Why would God allow a message that did not center in the only person he honors? Why would he allow a message like that to be the means of obtaining grace or the remission of sin or spiritual strength, do you really think he would allow that to happen? No. It would be dishonoring to his son. Right. So whatever benefits the gospel announces, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, eternal inheritance, gift of the Holy Spirit, justification, you can't get that if you don't hear the gospel. Amen. And you can't keep it if you don't continue to hear the gospel. Amen. That's what it means when it says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, amen. So Paul is explaining explaining what he's preaching. But given what you're highlighting here is that we have to strive lawfully. Strive lawfully, yeah, that's, that's right, amen. See, Rick, we, we constantly say this, but it's good to say it continually. Yeah. That one of the chief purposes in salvation is God is demonstrating his wisdom. So we shouldn't expect <clears throat> salvation to be simple. Mm -hmm. All these means that God develops are ways of the ways God has of yeah. highlighting and accentuating how wise He is. You know, if we had a, I have a computer at home, but you know, if I had a, my children were two years old, I wouldn't expect them to be able to produce anything out of that computer. It's too complex for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't expect anything, but if they're going to use it profitably, they're going to have to grow up and learn about it. Otherwise, that's not going to do anything. Amen. For them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Salvation isn't becoming simple for people. Mm -hmm. It's people growing up into Christ Jesus so that they can make greater use of salvation. Amen. Mm -hmm. If God dumbs it down, then God isn't fully known by what He's doing in salvation. It was to contradict His purpose. Remember, right. remember this all is anchored to God's purpose. God's purpose is to gather everything in heaven, and everything on earth, into one. Mm -hmm. In Christ Jesus, where everybody knows Him, everybody knows the Lord, everybody's in favor of the Lord. That's His. That's where He's headed. So, go ahead. The gospel would be like a filter. It only lets the truth through. That's right. That's right. Amen. Now, it's tragic to acknowledge this, but this is not the manner of in which men are commonly being taught today, what we've just been talking about through the gospel. This is not the manner in which men are commonly taught. Christian people I'm talking about. Churches I'm talking about. Bible colleges I'm talking about. Yeah. Religious books I'm talking about. <laughs> this is not the common approach to quote the Christian life. No. It is not. 
And anyone who thinks it is, it's just, they're simple. Because this is not, this is not what's being taught. Why not? Well, for one thing, as we have, I have stated before, you cannot capitalize on the gospel. You cannot put money in your pocket with the gospel. You cannot make a name for yourself with the gospel. You cannot gain a prominent position in the community through the gospel. If that's what you want to do, you're going to have to use something else. Now, you may call it gospel. You may sprinkle a little Jesus on there like garlic powder. But that is not that's not what that's not what God's doing. God's not making you famous, He's making Himself famous. Amen. That's what glorying in the Lord means. He's the dominant consideration. Amen. And you see how great God is in his great salvation. That's what it's designed to do. Not only you see it, but holy angels see it too. Now Paul says, By revelation he made this known to me. Other versions read, God himself revealed it. The Amplified Bible says direct revelation. See, you've got revelation, but it's, it's, it comes, <laughs> see, by the time it gets to you, it's gone through a lot of other people. Yeah. Comes through Christ, comes through apostles, comes through some minister sent to you, may come through some secondary person. See, it comes, mm -hmm. it came direct from Jesus, direct to Paul. He said, well, that's how God does with me, too. No, I'm sorry he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Apostles got stuff direct, and then they became ministers to distribute it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't learn what the apostles learned on your own. Mm -hmm. yes, amen. You can't say, well, I'm, I'm just going to pray God will give me to understand Romans without reading it because it's so long and everything. And it won't happen that way. Sure. That's why Paul's talking like he does here. He, by revelation, is given to me. If Jesus wanted to give it by revelation to everybody, that's what he did done. But this is not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God works through representatives. Jesus is the primary representative. That's the capital R representative. Then he has next uh, representative that he directly gives it to, and they begin to distribute it. Then each person hears that and distributes what they grasp. They distribute then keeps on filtering down seats yeah. through the body of Christ. By revelation, he made it known to me. The uh, New Century Bible says, God has shown me. The English Revised says, he's showing it, showing it to me. The Message Bible, as his, his characteristic says, I got the inside story on this from God himself. Most of the versions say by revelation. Now, what does that mean, revelation? Lexically, or a dictionary definition of revelation, a lane bear making naked a disclosure of truth concerning things before unknown. Use of events by which things or states or persons hitherto withdrawn from view are made visible to all. So a revelation speaks of something that already existed. It was already in place. It's not in the state of being developed. But it couldn't be seen. It was like covered with a veil, like the Holy of Holies. Revelation is when God opens up what is already in place but can't be seen. Now, it's on purpose that it can't be seen. It's of a different dimension. That's how God hides it. It's a different category of knowledge that men can't learn. <laughs> the colleges can't teach this kind of knowledge because it's outside the scope mm -hmm. of human experience, yes. see? So here, but you've got to know it to be saved. Here, here's the catch. Yeah. 
It's not in this domain that normally gets accessed by natural people. It's not in the house they live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but they've got to know it to be saved. <laughs> so Paul says he revealed, he, he broke, cracked the shell and opened the thing up to me. So here it's depicted as something hidden by the curtain of obscurity, but God pulled it back mm -hmm. himself so it could be clearly seen. Now it's not the intellectual complexity of the thing that makes it hard to understand. <clears throat> it's that something stands between the person and the thing mm -hmm. being revealed. Down, if you take it down at its root level, that something is the flesh. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that stands between, like it eclipses. <laughs> you know, you could take a, at the bright, bright sunlight, take a dime mm -hmm. and put it over your eye and it'll blot the sun out. Yeah. Uh -huh. You'll be able to see the sun. <laughs> but it's not because the dime was bigger than the sun. All right, flesh is that dime. Yeah, uh -huh. And to reveal something, God had to do something about the flesh. Mm -hmm. Amen. Is that ever? So from God's viewpoint, he opened it up. From Paul's viewpoint, he brought him up. <laughs> See? But it's the same, it's the same effect. Now at this point... <laughs> It's important to see that all this relates to being blessed, chapter 1, verse 3. It relates to being chosen, chapter 1, verse 4. It relates to being predestinated unto adoption, chapter 1, verse 5. It relates to being accepted, chapter 1, verse 6. It relates to forgiving of sins, chapter 1, verse 7. It relates to obtaining an inheritance, chapter 1, verse 11. And it relates to being sealed, chapter 1, verse 14. This revelation has to do with all those, mm -hmm. all those things, yeah. see? Now, when you read those things, they're not commonly understood, at least not to a very good degree. Mm -hmm. Haven't you found this to be so? These are matters that are not that clear to people, maybe people would like them to be clear, but they're hearing a message that doesn't clear them up. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever's being declared in the pulpit isn't clearing these things up. What's that mean? They're not preaching gospel. Because yeah. the gospel clarifies these things. Yeah. <laughs> so salvation is not just a rescue operation. It is that. It is that. But you're rescued in order. You come out of Egypt in order to get into Canaan. You leave Babylon in order to go back to Jerusalem. You leave earth in order to go to heaven, see? The mystery. He made known to me, revealed the mystery. Now, in Scripture, mystery is just not something that's not comprehended. It's something that man cannot comprehend by his, his own ability, mm -hmm. but it is something that is already in place. Yeah. It already exists. It needs to be revealed or opened to be understood. And if it's not understood, the effects of it <coughs> can't be realized. Now, does it make sense that in salvation they shall all know me? They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. See? So the gospel is, is telling you about God, mm -hmm. what God has done. And as this knowledge you get a hold of, knowledge, when you have the knowledge of it, you've got a, you've got a grasp of it. It's like you've got the utensils you can start eating now. <laughs> Your children are little, you've got to... Feed them. <laughs> you have to feed them because they, they don't know how to handle the utensils. And new believers the same way. I've heard people say, we need to teach people how to feed themselves. Well, that sounds real smart. Do you, do you work on that with one-year-olds? No, you've got to teach people where the resources are so they can get a hold 
of the eating utensils. Faith is an eating utensil. Hope is an eating utensil. Edification is when you have a more utensils. You know, you get a nice house, you have different sized forks, and you got a, you got a kind of a battery of tools are set on the table for you to eat. Some people just eat with a fork. That's all. That's all they ever use. But in the kingdom, there's a lot of utensils yes, to use. A lot of savers. Yes. Sprinkle a little grace on this, changes the whole picture. <laughs> huh? Take a little divine sovereignty and <laughs> say, whoa, that changes the taste of that. But these all come through the gospel. The gospel is the things that open them up. The thing that causes the mystery to be hidden is not the divine intention itself. It's not that it's something so deep it just can't be penetrated. It's God has concealed it. He's put it where it can't be seen. Like he took the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. yeah. and put them where nobody could see them. Right. In the Ark of the Covenant. If you want you to know what they were really in there, you had to ask somebody who knew. Moses knew. Yeah. I put them in there. They're in there. You had to believe that, see? That's, right. yeah. That's the way the gospel is. God showed Paul the truth of the gospel like he showed Moses where the Ten Commandments were. Mm -hmm. And then Moses, knowing not only where the Ten Commandments were, but what they said, mm -hmm. he delivered it yeah. to the people. Mm -hmm. Now Paul, God has favored Paul by opening up mm -hmm. this salvation that was that's mysterious. It still has a, it still you sense the greatness of it. As you begin to meditate and muse upon the gospel and probe into it and the salvation of God, you're impressed with the, with the depth of it and the largeness of it. It begins to impress upon you that I've been thinking pretty small about this. This is a very large thing. It starts here and it ends up in eternity and all the places along the way. When you think that he's dealt with us in all wisdom and prudence and he's actually changing you to be like Christ. See, Christ became like you so you could become like him. Amen. Yeah, but a lot of preaching is just Christ became like you. It's, it's, it stops. <laughs> it stops there. But the only way for you to be accepted by God mm -hmm. is to be like the only one he accepts. Amen. Amen. The gospel announces all of this. Yeah. Now, the fact that the thing conceals the mystery is controlled by God himself. Mm -hmm. You can't hide this. Yeah. You may, you may want to obscure this to people who want to know it. God controls who sees it and who doesn't see it. Some people, he opens their eyes, whoop, they see it. Yeah. Other people, he closes their eyes yeah. so they can't see it. Huh? Some people, he wakes up. Amen. Some people, he puts to sleep. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. Amen. He's hid these things for the wise and prudent. The people who feel self-confident draws the blinds. Can't see it. Doesn't make any difference how good a student they are. Now Paul says, now I've seen it, I'm, I'm declaring this. How is it, Paul, that people can understand what you're saying? Well, I speak in words that the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. God has told the Holy Spirit, this is a figment of my imagination. <laughs> Holy Spirit, don't open this up to anybody unless they use the words you use. Don't let anybody see this. They've got to use the words that the Holy Spirit uses. Here's what you use, Holy Spirit. Paul's give you some of them. Love, chosen, predestinated, live, raised, given. He's, he's giving you some of these words. And when they use these words that the Holy Spirit uses, then the Holy Spirit comes in and opens their eyes. 
they use men's words, the Holy Spirit, he stays, he, he doesn't involve himself in that message at all. This accounts for the state of ignorance that exists in the spiritual, in the Christian community. This accounts for it. There's a lot of very intellectually brilliant people in the church that are very gifted, very gifted people intellectually. But there's a dumb as an ox when it comes to the things of God. On the other hand, there's some people that would never pass as an intellectual person who could take hold of these things. What's the difference? The spirit worked in one, spirit didn't work in the other. Why did the spirit work in this one, not in the other? Because this person heard the gospel, this person didn't. Yeah, That's how. In other words, in understanding what you do, in spiritual understanding, you take Moses and the prophets who were the they announced it was coming. They gave a hints. They gave like hints as to what was coming. And the Holy Spirit correlates the gospel with what Moses and the prophets said. He fits them together. Says this is that. Amen. Now Paul said, so the, I wrote, so that you can understand my knowledge of the mystery, is I wrote a four and few words. Now, shouldn't the gospel have been sufficient the first time? I mean, why is he talking about the gospel again? He, he, he would spend three years in Ephesus preaching and teaching the gospel. Wasn't that sufficient? Once you hear the gospel, isn't that enough? Well, I came from a background and said, yeah, that's, that's it. The gospel is to be preached to sinners, and then we teach the other saints how they're to live. That's how, how I was taught. Yeah, it's what I was taught. I'm quick to say that by my, not by my father. He learned it the hard way, too, that that wasn't it. He's saying this way because the gospel, you never say the gospel was the power of God unto salvation. <laughs> you never, it is the power of God, Amen. whether you just got in or you've been in for 50 years. Yeah. The gospels, haven't you found it to be so? Yeah. Be many of you, have found this already by experience. You found it to be so that the more you knew about the gospel, it like it shed light on everything, everything else. <clears throat> the era of mystery began to pass away in the light of the gospel. So I, I wrote to you about it before. This doesn't mean he wrote a letter sometime in the past. There's no evidence of that. He's talking about the previously in this letter, particularly chapters one and two. He summarized in chapters 1 and 2 what he's going <laughs> to expound. Now, I wrote briefly about this when I reminded you about divine provision. He's given us all things pertaining to life, and he's given us, uh, he's placed all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, that he's already in, that's the introduction to what he's saying now. And he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he predestinated us to the adoption of children. And he chose us in Christ. All of that was, he was briefly, briefly introducing what he's talking about now. Uh -huh. that's, that's, once you see that, it's, it's marvelous. A few words, I just said a few words about it. But they, I have to say some more now about it. <clears throat> He's going to talk about such things. He talked about such things. We have redemption through his blood. We've been created. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We're saved by grace through faith. Second chapter, verse 7 and 8. The Jew and Gentiles are brought together into one body. 15 and 20 of chapter 2. The church is being prepared as the habitation of God through the Spirit. Chapter 2.22, what is all that? This is an introduction mm -hmm. to salvation, yeah. which is announced in the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just, it just the thing is so glorious to me, it's just, just <laughs> hard to put it in other words. Notice that in all those few words, chapters 1 and 2, that the one who does the determining and the effective work is always God. You know, it was always God who did it. He didn't say, and you did, and you did, and you did, and you did. Yes. Brother Gibbons, you can see that this is, a, this is productive preaching. 
You know, notice that his introduction wasn't like filled with jokes or just. It was like he actually that laid out introduction. the introduction of, of that was going to ready their minds to That's be able right, to receive. Amen. This was his introduction. Yeah, you could. Amen. You ever heard an introduction like that? You maybe, you, maybe you have. I, you probably have by now. Heard an introduction like that, but that was an introduction. Yeah. That first two chapters, to what he had to say. To this day, this kind of salvation remains hidden to the masses. The number of Christian plans, mm -hmm. techniques, courses, routines, and laws, yeah. they're, they're almost without number. You'll find someone that tell you how to fast. You'll find someone to tell you how to pray. You'll tell, find someone to tell you how to make a prayer journal. You'll tell someone to tell you how to make a daily diary. They all got their whatevers. Mm -hmm. But salvation addresses effectively all of those areas. I can tell you right now, you don't need a diary. Now, I'm not against diaries. I understand what I'm saying here. But I'm saying it's amazing what you can recall if you walk in the light and live in the power of it. And Paul says, so I'm writing so you, when you read, they were going to read this epistle. <laughs> Could you imagine this epistle being written to the first church of the Frigidaire? The preacher stands up at the board and says, we got a letter here from Apostle Paul. He's going to read it to the whole congregation. And if you're at Colossae, he'd say, and we got another one here that was written to Laodicea, and he asked us to read the letter he wrote to Laodicea, too. He, you'd have someone say, hey, just a minute, we got our own church. We're not interested, We're not interested in the letters written to you. See? When you read, when you read... See, if you're a Jew, you had to learn to read. Because you not only had to read the commandments, you had to post them every place, yeah. put them on your forehead, put them on your, on your garments, on your walls. You had to know how to read. Someone <coughs> said, well, I never learned how to read. Well, learn how to read. Yeah. Brother Robert's mother, Sister Betty, I mentioned to for... 32 years, yeah, 32 years, she didn't know how to read. She's married with children, and she didn't know how to read when she came to the assembly. She could not read. She learned how to read out of the King James Bible. My sister's father-in-law, Andy Powers, is the same way. He didn't know how to read. He's in his 40s. He learned how to read. Now you'd never, you'd never tell now they didn't, that there was a time when they couldn't read. You can't give them something they can't read. When you read, be a good reader in the kingdom of God. Be a good reader. At least say I've read the Bible. I didn't read it through at least once a year, every year. Read the Bible. Read the Word of God. When you read... So he didn't envision a church that was ignorant That's right. at all. He assumes that the epistle he written, his written was clear enough that if you'd read it, mm -hmm. God would work with you to see what it meant. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't understand Scripture because they just they haven't read it. Because yeah. mm -hmm. as soon as you read it, Amen. Holy yeah. Spirit's dispatched. Amen. Go down there and help that person. You found it to be so, I know already. You, you could give a per, personal testimony. What, what is it you'll know? You'll know my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to tell when you read what I've written that I do know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm writing what I've seen here. Yeah. There's at least two advantages a believer has. One, they've received the Holy Spirit. And two, God will open the eyes of their understanding. You put those two factors together and add them, add them together with reading, mm -hmm. changes the whole picture, doesn't it? It's not just so they could read, so they'd have something to argue about. That's right. <laughs> which is what you see. Most of the stuff you encounter nowadays, people are wanting to argue. It's, it's like You've already mentioned this, but most of all of it is what Paul said. They want to say, well, this was his opinion, and you know I do have a few of my own opinions, <coughs> yeah. but this is, 
But as an apostle that God's given yeah. things to. Yeah, a person <laughs> was made the mistake of arguing with me on this, and he said that was Paul's opinion. I said, well, I said that he was counted faithful. God, Jesus counted him faithful, putting him into the ministry. Yeah. Now, let's say it is an opinion. Whose opinion should I listen to? Should I listen to someone who's learned in the ways of God and can venture a view that is true, or should I listen to you? Which yeah. one would you say? Amen. I had to tell him, if you don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Salvation is also worked out in a united environment. He's going to comment on this in the fourth chapter extensively. In a united environment where each member is participating, giving what they have. Mm -hmm. That coupled with the reading, see that's the kind of environment that understanding grows up in. Yeah. Yeah. Each member has what Romans 12, 3 calls a measure of faith. Mm -hmm. That is, he's received faith to do this or that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a teach, exhort, show mercy, whatever. From another viewpoint, it's the spiritual gifts that God has given to everyone. Yeah. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12 says, everyone's been given a measure of the Spirit to do something that will benefit the body of Christ. Yeah. Everybody. And if you were Peter, you'd call it a, the grace of God, a good steward of the manifold grace of God. And Romans 12 calls it a measure of faith. What I'm saying is that understanding flourishes in the atmosphere of, of a body mm -hmm. of believers. Amen. Now, this is one of the things against a lot of house churches. Yeah. We're a house church, so we're obviously not anti-house church. Yeah. Uh -huh. But a lot of house churches are just like clubs. And everybody talks, but it's not exactly edifying. Hmm? Yeah. This what this telling you is this truth that we're talking about is not clearly seen by most Christians. Mm -hmm. They don't take advantage of assemblies yeah. with this in mind. Yeah. He's writing to a church, so when they're together and read his epistle. He knows that there'll be some kind of exchange that'll take place. Something will be seen. Someone will, oh, mm -hmm. they'll see. And they'll say, yeah, that's just exactly like Paul said. Yeah. He did have knowledge in the mystery. What we didn't understand before, we're beginning to see. We're beginning to see it now. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So Paul was telling us the truth. He did have the real message. <laughs> And he closes by saying, in the mystery of Christ. Other versions say the secret of Christ, a secret plan concerning the Messiah, the plan regarding Christ, it's a new living translation, and the truth of Christ. Now the fact that Christ is surrounded by mystery is confirmed by the fact that he was in the world and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So there was an element of mystery that surrounded Christ. So that if you weren't familiar with scripture, you just saw him as a rabbi, a teacher. Just a kind of an extraordinary Jewish teacher. Or maybe you saw him as a, as a miracle worker. But you didn't see him as the Christ. The one man on whom everything about salvation hinges. Why the apostles themselves didn't know this when they were before Jesus died. Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? Well, it says they didn't mention anyone that was living. He said, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. None of them said Socrates. He said, who do you say I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, that was the first thing, thou art the Christ, mm -hmm. the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed art thou, 
Simon Bar Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. God showed you, pull it back, see, the mystery of Christ. <laughs> see it? God showed him the mystery of Christ. Here was a man, great teacher, great miracle worker, but that really isn't what it was. He was the Christ. He's the one man that God honors and the one man on which everything else depends. And the message of the gospel is about that man, Jesus Christ. I, this word Christ is, I don't think, is understood. I, I can remember when I, I didn't even think about like what Christ meant. I, did, it's, I didn't even look into it. But when I did, oh, he's the anointed one. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want something from God? Got to come through Christ. Amen. You want to say something to God? It's got to go through Christ. Yes. Um, I was thinking back when you were talking about Peter, I was thinking that when he said the Christ, he wasn't saying a Christ, because yes. the Christ. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Remember Jesus said some people would say, Lo, here is Christ. There is Christ. He's in the desert over there. Yeah, that's right, Sister Mariah. That's absolutely right. Now here's some of the mysterious things about Christ. Things you would never know mm -hmm. if God hadn't have told you. God's going to judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Romans 2.10. How would you know that if that wasn't revealed? Yeah. Yeah. See? Men are justified freely through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. You want to be pronounced free from sin? You want to participate in God's righteousness? The redemption is something had to be bought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus paid the price for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a price attached mm -hmm. to you being made clean. Mm -hmm. And you being justified from all things. There was a price connected with that. Yeah. And Jesus paid it. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God just like is, it, is there when you want him. Just call out on him. He's right there. It doesn't make any difference whether you're in or out, or saved or lost. No, this isn't the case at all. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We joy in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we're happy. We're joyful about God. How would you know this if this wasn't revealed? We reign in life by Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, huh? How about it? What is your assessment of your life? Have you been defeated by life or have you conquered? Which one is it? We reign in life by Jesus Christ. Grace reigns through righteousness by Jesus. So you say, I notice that people that are good, bad things happen to them. Well, that may not be as true as you think it is, but grace reigns through righteousness. So if you want a lot of grace, be righteous. Yeah. Christ is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. How many churches, by their practice, don't acknowledge that Christ is the head? They think nothing of doing things Jesus forbids. He's the head. We're alive to God through Christ. I won't read all of these, but all of these are veiled until you're on the inside. Yeah. I mean, you may know the Bible says this. I don't, I'm not talking about someone knowing the Bible says this. Uh -huh. I'm talking about someone that knows the truth of these things, that sees the truth of them, depends upon them, <coughs> relies upon them, and you wouldn't know it if it hadn't been disclosed in the gospel. Yeah, well, they're actually... All of these things, I just took a few of them, 24 of them here. Mm -hmm. They actually 
are opening up the gospel to you. <laughs> this is all part of the gospel. This is the announcement of salvation. <laughs> now, this kind of knowledge is required if you're going to live. Man lives by every word of God. <clears throat> I got, what does that mean? Man lives by every word of God. That means if you, you live by the Song of Solomon, is that what it means? It means you're able, the word of God is like a reservoir of all kind of treasures in it. You know where to go and what to pick. You say, I'm discouraged. Seems like everybody's against me. Seems like I don't fit in any place, all right? Now you got to go to the treasure house. It's all in the gospel. You got to, you say, oh, here, here, here's what I needed. If God be for us, who could be against us? That's how, this is how you survive. You live by the word of God. It's how you, God has said, God is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. See that? You're living by every word of, you wear every word of God. You say, I'm feeling weak. I feel he pleaded. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. See, you pick that. <laughs> It's all in the gospel. Gospel realities. Yeah, very good. Yes. You're about that. Speaking, I heard somebody say the other day, well, you should never be afraid. That's a that's not unbeliever. And I yeah. thought of the scripture to what time I am afraid. Yeah. I'll trust in the Lord. Amen. Yeah. I've shared this with you, I don't so many times it's probably boring to hear about it, but maybe you haven't may have heard it, but and my uh, first wife was was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. She was utterly helpless, totally paralyzed. And she told me, she whispered in my ear, she says, I'm afraid. I'd ask God, uh, Give me a ready mind. So when an occasion came up where I had to say something, I'd know what to say. And it came right to my mind. What time I am afraid, I will put my trust in thee. Amen. Psalm 25, 8. And I shared that with her. She was able to take hold of it. Now, this, see, you can do the same thing. Amen. Man lives by every word of God. Sometimes another person's life mm -hmm. may depend on you getting the resource. Amen. And I'm telling you that the gospel is the greatest yeah. resource of all. Amen. How wide is the gospel? Well, Paul said the gospel was first preached to Abraham. So that, yeah. that's the biggest summation of all. I will bless all nations. That's the biggest summation. Mm -hmm. Salvation is intended to bless, yeah. benefit, make joyful, mm -hmm. give you a sense of advantage. It's all in the gospel. So Paul has established to the Ephesians the gospel I preached. It does what God wants done. Mm -hmm. Amen. But you've got to have your mind refreshed with it. Mm -hmm. It has to be stated. Why? Because you're in a in hostile environment. You're in an environment where there are opposing forces trying to wash away things that are in your in your mind. Just, why is it that way? That's how God intended it, brother. <coughs> this is exactly how God intended to save you. Taking you through the desert. Taking you through the furnace. Taking you through all kind of trials. This is how he saves you. Mm -hmm. All along the line, you've got the gospel. It keeps yeah. announcing this good news. Telling you about the, what's up ahead and it'll save you in the end. So this is God's strategy, and he's, he's protected you by hiding this good stuff from his enemies. Amen. <laughs> they can't take it from you because they can't see it. They, yeah. See, they can't. if they could get at it, they'd take it from you. Make oh, no yeah. mistake about it. I think I'll close there. Any of you have anything you'd like to add tonight? Yeah, that's why you don't cast your pearls before <laughs> yes, the swine. <laughs> yes, Brother Ricky. Yeah, that word you gave that Jesus that man does not live by bread alone. Of course, the word for bread there, he's not just talking about, you know, bread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a general word for meat, and there's a great variety of meats, and we've 
we find that there's God doesn't just deposit all the nutrition you need in one kind of one kind of. That's source. right. You gotta rely on a variety of Every sources. Word. Yeah. I mean, if I if I'm out there and it's 100 degrees and I haven't had a lot of water, you can pump all the meat you want in me, but I'm gonna die. Because <laughs> yeah, right. I gotta get water. Water. And there there's you gotta have that variety. But here's the great thing about the gospel: the gospel isn't one like one piece of meat. Yeah. It's like a feast. That's right, tables. It's like you can a table. Come to the table, and there's a great variety there, but it's everything you need for life of God, and it's just all yeah. in that gospel. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter yeah. of finding that proper food there on the table. To... Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right. Our dear Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for the great salvation you've given us in Christ Jesus. We pray for grace not to neglect it. To so always see it as a rich resource and to keep it alive in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.